Hey folks, happy Friday. Yeah, it's another uh, another Kendala. Uh, this is again the 858, uh, I think it's called Forafina. Um, so I, I, I've always called these Kendalas, although these guys call them Claro wrapper. They're green. So today is, it's been overcast, drizzling all day, but I think the sun is trying to make an appearance before the day is done. And it's Friday, so it's glorious no matter what. And it's been a while since I've seen you guys. Hope you all had a wonderful Easter. Or Passover, or uh, what's the solstice, or whatever. Uh, hope you all had a nice couple of weeks. I did. I enjoyed the time off, uh, both from work and then from social media stuff. It was nice to take a break. So let's head home. <clears throat> Um, and I wanted to point out, I got a question last uh, last Friday ramble. <laughs> Somebody asked me which of these buildings I work in. I don't work here. This is where I buy my cigars. So uh, I work elsewhere at an undisclosed location that actually I'm not even allowed to film in or around. Which is one of the reasons I wait until I get to the cigar store to start the, the video. It's just no need to anger the powers that be. So I've, um, I'm reading a new book and I thought that might be something fun to talk about today because it's it's an interesting book. So it's a book by Christopher Schwartz and it's titled The Anarchist Tool Chest. Now if you don't know, if you're, if you're not into woodworking and sort of popular woodworking books or and such, you may not know who Christopher Schwartz is. He was the editor at or an editor at Fine Woodworking for quite a long time very knowledgeable, really interested in history of woodworking, um, so what, I, what I would call almost archaeological woodworking, you know, trying to rediscover lost arts, and, and he left Fine Woodworking and actually started a his own publishing house uh, called Lost Art Press. And I believe The Anarchist Tool Chest was the first book that they published. I could be wrong about that, but I'm fairly certain. And it was published, um, boy, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago. And I wanted to read it, you know, as soon as I saw it came out and, you know, read the descriptions and reviews and everything, I wanted to read it, but I just didn't get around to getting it. And I finally got around to, to getting the book, and I've been reading it, and it is, it is, it is mind-opening, uh, to, to put it bluntly. And you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, how the heck can a woodworking book be my... Well, it's really intriguing. So, the first three quarters of the book are really about tools. And uh, what, in Christopher Schwartz's opinion, constitutes the, the tool kit that you need. You know, what are the tools that you need to consider yourself a woodworker? Or, or more, more precisely, to consider yourself a joiner. Uh, so it's really focused on joinery. And now, he does not ignore machines. There, there, there's, there's discussion of machines, and uh, they, they certainly form part of it, but it is very heavily focused on tools, hand tools, uh, chisels, saws, planes, things like that. And a lot of it, it, and I think he admits this freely throughout the book, a lot of it is his opinion rather than anything that's that's uh, you know historically factual or anything like that, but it's it's reasoned opinion, and he's obviously put a lot of thought into these things. 
So it, it really makes interesting reading, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is then he gets into this concept of anarchy, and it's an unfortunate word. He's using it in a historically correct sense, but it's not what you think when you hear the word anarchy. So it's not, you know, these kids that throw rocks through the windows of Starbucks, which I don't understand. I mean, I, I get it, they make lousy coffee, but I don't know why you have to get violent about it. So it's not that, it's, it's something called aesthetic anarchy. And if you're familiar with the arts and crafts movement and uh, who was it, uh, Morris and who was Morris's friend, well, I can't remember now, but th that whole sort of movement of, of trying to revitalize craftsmanship, it, it's a similar concept, you know, and it, it kind of focuses around this idea of us being on a conveyor of consumerism. So we are constantly buying things that have planned obsolescence, they last a few years, and then we throw them away and we go and buy them again. And this is, um, this is kind of built into the system if you really think about it. Now it used to be that if you wanted a new coffee table, just to use furniture as the example, you went down to Bob's furniture shop and he built you a coffee table and you know you had input in the, into the design and when you got it home it was your coffee table probably for the rest of your life because it was built to last and when Bob needed to get a new chisel he went to Fred the blacksmith and said hey Fred make me a new chisel and Fred made it to Bob's specifications and when Bob got it it was it was meant to last you know me you wouldn't need to buy another chisel. None of that is true anymore. Everything is built to not last. And we're a captive of this. So this idea of anarchy is more about sort of breaking out of that mold and trying to allow yourself the ability to make things that will last, or buy things from craftsmen locally made that will last. And as a first step in this process, he then moves into the building of a tool chest. And, you know, he built a tool chest for himself, for his tools, based on what he thinks a tool chest should be, and all of his studies of, of historical tool chests and everything else. But the tool chest that you build would be different but it would be for you, and it would be built to last. It would be built from locally sourced materials, using uh, quality tools to construct, and using historically authentic methods of construction. It, it's a way of sort of taking back your right to quality. And if you've been following me for a long time, you know about my hang up with quality and Robert Persig and all of that. So I found it to be very, very fascinating. Um, I'm not done the book yet. I'm, I'm just at the, the point where he's building the, uh, the tool chest. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. I do plan on, one of the reasons I bought the book now is that I plan on building a tool chest because um, I, I need to have a better way to store my tools than I currently do. So that was already planned, and I thought, oh, what a great opportunity to finally read this book. And boy, I'm really glad that I did. Now, I don't know if I'm going to wind up building his chest. I, I, I don't know yet, because I haven't really gotten through that part. And, you know, there's some things about what I've seen of it that I'm not sold on yet. So we'll see how it goes. But I thought it was it was worth talking about, not, not, not necessarily because I think you're all going to run out and buy the book, but... If you're interested in woodworking, you should buy the book. If you're just interested in the concept of craftsmanship and quality, uh, something worth thinking about. Mull it over. Uh, make a VR. I'd love to see a VR on something like this. I haven't seen one in quite a while. Um, we used to do that a lot. We used to sort of converse back and forth by VRs, and unfortunately, well, you, you know where that's going.
don't want to get into that. But uh, yeah, it's it's nice to, to be able to, to do that, to respond to someone. I'm pulling off here because I am actually stopping at one of the local restaurants here in the wonderful town of Lansdale to pick up a takeout dinner for my wife and I. And we're right here by the Lansdale train station. If you all want to go to Google Maps and see where I live. Anyway, folks, I, I hope you're all having a uh, great week. Looking forward to a great weekend. I will see you on uh, on Sunday. And until then, take care.